Okay, welcome back. Lecture 8-2, Ebbinghaus, Herman Ebbinghaus, that is. Let's shoot over to this. This is just going to be a quick lecture, but I really, you know, as we're starting the memory chapter, you know me by now, I like to kind of connect some of this stuff with the bigger history of psychology, remind you of some things that, that you already kind of learned about, um, and in doing so, kind of set the stage for the more current knowledge about memory that you're going to learn about. So uh, again, this will be a quick one. I just want to kind of bring you back to a point uh, I made during um, the first chapter. And maybe I'll make it in a little more detail here, but um, it'll be the same basic idea. And the idea was just this, that throughout the history of science, the history of thought, um, there has been this appreciation of mathematics and, and numbers. And so a lot of this, I actually say, I, I would actually claim began with Pythagoras. It, a lot of things go, you know, even before that as well. But Pythagoras was, was one who really um, argued for the beauty and power of mathematics and, and that if you could express things, in fact, he thought that there was, there was interesting mathematics underlying almost everything. So we think of things like the Pythagorean theorem where he's like, well, look at this triangle. There's a mathematical relationship that, that governs how these different lengths of things work. And he found mathematics in all sorts of interesting places. Uh, again, one of the things I mentioned with him is like music. He noticed that, you know, when you have a string like on a guitar, um, the sound it makes... <laughs> have one right here and and we can do this with the sound so if we take a given string like this last one here if I make a sound that's a pretty deep sound but if I make the string a little shorter it, it gets higher so I'm changing how much of the string can vibrate here and as you make it shorter and shorter then the sound becomes higher and higher. And in fact, he argued there were certain sounds that really work out well together. But others don't. It's hard for me to do ones that don't fit. So at any rate, the ones that work together do so because they have a certain mathematical relationship. And in fact, the whole sound that you get and the feelings that that produces is a function of the length of the line. And you can express a lot of this in really mathematical ways. So Pythagoras was saying music, you know, music that stirs the soul at its core is math. Further, he would argue that if you can get to that math level, then you truly understand what's going on. Okay, um, Newton, of course, brought the same notion to physics. Um, there were a lot of ideas in physics. What Newton really brought were formulas, that's his principles, uh, where he captured things like acceleration, etc., in specific formulas. Uh, and that really made everyone go, whoa, he really understands, right? So when you can get to the math, it suggests a really accurate objective, deep understanding of what you're studying. And so, you know, the challenge for psychology, as I told you, was, you know, can you do that with psychology? Can you actually capture anything related to psychology in terms of math? And, you know, I told you that Ernst Weber early on, um, before there was even a psychology, he called himself a psychophysicist. There was no psychologist yet. Um, psychophysics, psycho, the mind, the physics of the mind. You know, it could have been what we called psychology today, um, but we don't. But Weber, that's what he studied. And, and his notion of physics of the mind, you know, gives you that sense that he was thinking like a physicist does. And physicists think in terms of math and equations. And in fact, one of his great contributions was Weber's law. Uh, and this is that thing about just noticeable differences. You know this pretty well now that when you have to tell the, the difference between two um, items, the amount of difference you need to detect that difference depends on how, well, let's say heavy, if we go with weights, how heavy that original weight is. If it's light, you can, then something that's just a little bit lighter, you can detect a difference. But if it's heavy, now it's got to be a lot heavier 
the second one before you can detect a difference. And in fact, what he showed is it has it's a specific ratio that holds up a mathematical relationship. That second one has to be a certain proportion more than the first one in order for you to detect a difference. But whatever that proportion was, it was a constant. And so it, it would hold, you know, across different original weights, so to speak. The important part of all that is he was capturing a subjective thing, feeling a difference between two things, two weights, two brightnesses of lights, two sounds, your ability to actually sense a difference in your mind followed a mathematical formula. Um, and that was really important for people starting to think, okay, we can study the mind in that way. All right. So that brings us to the hero of today's lecture, um, Herman von Ebbinghaus. Um, and here he is. And he's an interesting character for sure. He's an interesting character for a, a number of reasons. Um, one is he was doing what we're going to call cognitive psychology because that's really what this most of this memory work is. Uh, he was doing it before there was cognitive psychology. He was doing it before there was even a behavioral psychology. So, you know, notice that he's right at these very early days uh, of psychology um, and he studied memory, but he wanted to show that you could that memory followed mathematical relationships. Well, that is, that's what he did show. That's what he was able to show. And like memory, memory is such a, you know, what the heck is memory? Um, it, it seems like such a vague thing, our ability to kind of carry the past around with us somehow. Um, but he showed you could, you could think about that mathematically. And just to give you a little bit of detail now, about how he did it, because the other important thing about Ebbinghaus is that he was a, a real procedure nerd, <laughs> okay? Um, and that's another thing that makes science science, right? When you're going to do experiments, you have to do them in a very rigorous um, and objectively definable way so that other people can replicate your experiments. And he did this like, like few other people have. And so I want to kind of introduce you to his approach tell you a little bit about it because it is about memory. So, you know, it'll directly relate to this chapter, but it also attaches to that bigger point of, of psychology as a science and the impact that Ebbinghaus's work had in that regard. Okay, so let's just talk about what he did. So first of all, um, the, the participants in Ebbinghaus's experiment were Ebbinghaus. So all his experiments were on himself. Um, and so he would do these tests himself and he would do them again in a very precise and rigorous way. So here's a procedure. So first of all, we begin already with here. Here's the kinds of stimuli that he would use. These are called CVCs, constant vowel consonant, um, G-E-B, constant vowel consonant. You know, it's just a description of how you create these things, consonant with a vowel plus a consonant. But he would be careful to create these things that didn't, you know, had certainly did not spell English words. And in fact, that was his goal. He didn't want to test memory for things like words or pictures because he felt that we had too much already associated. Like certain words might, you know, spark certain thoughts in our mind, etc. And he thought that was all complicated that those were complications. So he wanted to study memory for things that were brand new to us, that we'd never seen before, that we had no associations with. And so he created a whole big set of these CVCs. Okay, that was step one. Um, now, in a given experiment, he would take a subset of these CVCs, let's say 20 of them. And first thing he would do is try to learn those 20. Oh, I won't show you this quite yet. Um, so let me just talk you through the learning. Even that he did very precisely. So he wanted to say the following. I'm going to study these until they are in my memory. Well, how do you know they're in your memory? Like how, how if I wanted to do what you did, how would I do that? And he was very clear about it. He said, here's what I did. I put those 20, I put them in a stack and I'd start at the top. And I would look at that first one and I'd try to commit, commit it to my memory. And I'd look at the second one, I'd look at the third one, and I'd go through, you know, let's say those 20. Uh, let's say more 16, because I think 16 was more like what he would do. Uh, and then he would, after he'd gone through them all, he would take a sheet of paper and he would try to write them all down. Okay. Early on, he couldn't do that, right? You, you couldn't just look at them all once and have all 16. So he'd have to go back to it and flip through them all again and try 
put them down and try writing them all down. And so the first thing is it took him a number of times through that whole set. And that's one of the things he recorded. How many times do I have to go through until I can recall them perfectly accurately twice in a row? <laughs> so he added this extra thing. So, you know, the, once, he, once he got and he wrote down all 16 and he actually got them all, he's like, okay, that's cool. Now let me take that paper and put it over here and let me take a new piece of paper and let me write them all down again. And if twice in a row, you know, without consulting any of this stuff, I can recall all 16 items accurately, then I've got them. They're in my memory. Okay. So that was start one, step one. And, and one of the things you can ask is, well, how long did it take you to get something into your memory? Um, but then he did an interesting thing. He let time pass various lengths of time and after that time had passed he'd take out a sheet of paper and he'd see if he could still recall the 16 or how many he could still recall in a sense he was studying forgetting more than memory he was studying how things leave your memory okay so now let's look at some some data here and so what he would show are things like this that when you first learn the material you can get to a point where you're 100 percent after you've done some learning, right? Um, but then if you let time pass, then over days, like even with just one day passed, you might be only at about 80% of that knowledge you can remember. At, at two days passed, you might be, you know, below 70% of them that you can remember. And so the first thing he did is trace out what we call for, forgetting curves. And he showed that these forgetting curves follow a really nice mathematical relationship. You're seeing them slant down. They continue. Notice this goes to 60. They continue and kind of show a nice exponential and eventually flatten out somewhere around 20%. You can almost always remember, you know, those 20%. Um, but that curve followed a nice mathematical relationship. And so it's like we forget things and there's a math to how we forget them. Something's going on in the brain that follows a mathematical relationship. That impressed scientists, that feel, I mean, just look at it. It looks like science, right? <laughs> this is how scientists are. He also did these other kind of interesting things. He would occasionally do things like go back to the, go back to the original things. And he would say, okay, I'm going to review it. And what he found was, it's not really well depicted on this graph, but what he found was, although it seemed like you forgot those items, if you went back to learn them, you could learn them again really quick. Okay. So, much quicker than you could originally. So you can relearn a set of items much, much quicker than it took you to originally learn those set of items. This was important for two reasons, like a couple of reasons. So one is it suggests that when we forget, we're not really forgetting. The information isn't disappearing. It may be just harder to get at. That might be what forgetting is. And if we give it another little boost of study, we can bring it back up so that we can easily get it again. So he started saying, well, memory is a little complicated. We can sometimes feel like we can't remember something, but it's still there. Uh, so, you, you know, when you go write that calculus exam and you studied hard and you write your calculus exam and two days later you feel like you've forgotten everything, you haven't. You could learn that material again very quickly. So he studied that relearning, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, here is the actual forgetting function, just so you get a sense um, across, um, in this case, hours in this experiment. He's looking at how forgetting is changing over hours. And again, you know, he got famous for doing these kinds of functions. Important for, you know, uh, the, the, the early days of psychology, again, sort of what Weber was doing for perceptual experience, you know, which is heavier Ebbinghaus was now showing a similar thing for memory, which was even more sort of mystical than perception. Uh, and so he was really suggesting, hey, when we're, you know, this new science of psychology, we can include memory in that study as well. Um, and he was really also just starting to set the stage for cognitive psychology, which just didn't exist yet. But when it did exist, a lot of cognitive psychologists went back to Ebbinghaus's work and said, see, he's able, so let's think of the behaviorist thing here, he's able to study something like memory. You behaviorists say we can't study that well, but he was studying it pretty well. 
What we think is if you're clever enough, if you design the experiments well enough, you can scientifically study things like memory. So Ebbinghaus very much became the hero of the new cognitive psychologists who were interested in studying things like memory and attention and consciousness, um, things that you couldn't see directly, but they felt you could still study. There's still to this day... Um, a seminar at University of Toronto. It's held downtown. Uh, it's mostly cognitive psychologists, and it's called the Ebbinghaus Empire. They consider themselves the children of Ebbinghaus, as it will, as as it, as it were, continuing in his tradition of science. So he's a very important character to the study of memory, uh, and again to the sort of expansion of psychology in the early days. I thought it was really important you meet him. Fantastic. Talk to you later. Bye bye.